Chapter 16, Ethical Pluralism, Prima Facie Duties and Ethical Particularism. Ross's Ethic of Prima Facie Duties. Every moral theory we have considered thus far is absolutist. Most of these views are monistic, defending the idea that there is just a single absolute moral rule. But as we saw in the last chapter, some absolutists reject monism. They think that there are a number of moral rules that may never be broken. It's now time to take a look at another option. These are the theories that reject both monism and absolutism. Such theories are pluralistic. They endorse the existence of at least two fundamental moral rules, and each of these rules is non-absolute. In some cases, it is morally acceptable to break them. The Oxford professor W. D. Ross, born 1877, died 1971, was the philosopher who first developed this version of pluralism. He had a special term for these non-absolute rules. He called them principles of prima facie duty, and we will stick with that label in what follows. A prima facie duty is an excellent non-absolute permanent reason to do or refrain from something, to keep one's word, be grateful for kindnesses, avoid hurting others, and so on. As Ross saw it, each prima facie duty is a fun fundamental importance. None of these duties can be derived from one another or from any more basic principle. Crucially, each prima facie duty may sometimes be overridden by other such duties. Though there is always good reason, say, to keep a promise or prevent harm to others, morality sometimes requires that we break a promise or do harm. Likewise, for each of the other prima facie duties. Ross was convinced that absolutism in all of its forms is implausible. Those theories that endorse more than one absolute rule are bound to yield contradiction. Those that endorse only a single absolute moral rule are too narrow and fail to see that there are a number of independently important moral considerations. For instance, while Ross accepted the utilitarian emphasis on doing good and preventing harm to others, he also agreed with Kant that justice was morally important in its own right. Ross identified seven prima facie duties, each of which is meant to to represent a distinct basis of our moral requirements. 1. Fidelity, keeping our promises, being faithful to our word. 2. Reparations, repairing harm that we have done. 3. Gratitude, appropriately acknowledging benefits that others have given us. 4. Justice, ensuring that virtue is rewarded and vice punished. 5. Beneficence, enhancing the intelligence, virtue, or pleasure of others. 6. Self-improvement, making oneself more intelligent or virtuous. 7. Non-malfeasance, preventing harm to others. Ross did not claim that this list was complete. He allowed that there might be other prima facie duties, but each of these seven duties, he thought, definitely did belong on the list. The term prima facie duty can be misleading. That's because these things are not really duties, but rather permanent moral reasons that partly determine whether an action truly is, in the end, morally required. To say, for instance, that there is a prima facie duty of beneficence is to say the following. 1. There is always a strong reason to benefit others. 2. This reason may sometimes be outweighed by competing reasons. 3. If this reason is the only moral reason that applies in a given situation, then benefiting others becomes our all-things-considered duty. In other words, what we are really finally morally required to do in that situation. Focus for a moment on the first item. It provides us with a way to test Ross's specific roster of prima facie duties. Suppose that there are situations in which there is no reason at all to benefit others. If that were so, there would be no prima facie duty of beneficence. I will let you do the testing yourself because I am most interested in the general theory of prima facie duties rather than in any specific version of it. Even if Ross's group of seven rules includes too much or too little, this would not undermine the ethic of prima facie duties. What it would show, and this would certainly be important, is that Ross's own list was off base, but a better list might make the cut. So let's instead consider the big picture and reveal the attractions and difficulties of the general model of morality that Ross advanced. First, as usual, the attractions. The advantages of Ross's view. Pluralism. The greatest attraction of the ethic of prima facie duties is its ability to accommodate our sense that there is, indeed, more than just a single fundamental moral consideration. To Ross and to most of the rest of us, it does seem that the very fact of our having promised to do something generates some reason to follow through, even if keeping our promise fails to bring happiness, reward virtue, prevent misery, or do anything else. That we have given our word is reason enough to do what we have promised.
but no one believes that promising is the only thing like this. There does seem to be something immoral, for instance, when someone repays a kindness with ingratitude, even if, in unusual circumstances, being ungrateful is the right way to go. Whether or not you agree with the whole of Ross's list, you may well sign on to the idea that fidelity and gratitude, at the very least, each possess independent moral importance. If you do, that is enough to force a shift away from monism. We are sometimes permitted to break the moral rules. Ross's position also easily explains the widespread belief that the moral rules may sometimes acceptably be broken. There is always something to be said in favor of keeping a promise, but I should break my promise to meet a student for coffee if my daughter has a medical emergency and needs to be taken to the hospital. We all accept that there are circumstances in which it is morally acceptable to break a promise, allow harm to others, pass up a chance at self-improvement, and so on. Ross's theory straightforwardly explains this. Moral Conflict the ethic of prima facie duties also appears to make good sense of our experience of moral conflict. Duties conflict when they can't all be fulfilled. On absolutist views, such conflict yields contradiction. But Ross's theory easily avoids this. Consider the case of a poor single mother whose child is too sick to go to school. The mother has a duty to report to work. By taking the job, she is promised to reliably show up as scheduled. But suppose that she has just moved to town, has no friends or family there, and isn't allowed to bring her child to work. She also has a duty to care for her child, especially if no one else is available to do so. What should she do? The Rossian can say of such a case that there is a conflict of prima facie duties. There is a strong case for showing up to work. There is a strong reason to care for one's child. Sometimes we can't do both. But no contradiction occurs because we can distinguish between a standing reason, a prima facie duty, to do something, and an all things considered final duty to do it. When these final duties conflict, when we say, in the end, that you are absolutely required to show up at work and are also absolutely required to care for your child, then there is contradiction. Ross's view avoids this problem entirely. I'm not intent on defending a specific verdict in this example. If Ross is correct, the key thing is that context will determine just how important a prima facie duty is. The consideration at the heart of such a duty, promise keeping, preventing harm, righting one's wrongs, etc., is always morally important but it is not always morally decisive. That is precisely what distinguishes a prima facie duty from an absolute one. Moral regret. Another way in which Ross's theory very nicely handles moral conflict is in its view of moral regret. When moral claims conflict and we can't honor them all, we think that it is right to feel regret at having to give up something important. Regret is evidence that something of value has been sacrificed. When prima facie duties conflict and one takes priority over the other, the lesser duty doesn't just disappear. It still has some weight, even though in the circumstances it is not as morally powerful as the conflicting duty. Regret is our way of acknowledging this forsaken duty, our way of recognizing that something of value was lost in the conflict. Indeed, this provides us with a reasonable test for knowing what our prima facie duties are. The test is simple. There is a prima facie duty to act in a certain way only if it would always be appropriate to regret our failure to act that way. If there were nothing valuable about gratitude, for instance, then missing a chance to express it would not be cause for regret. But it is. And that shows that there is something important about gratitude, even if it isn't all important. That's just what Ross believed. Addressing the anti-absolutist arguments. Ross's view also provides a direct reply to all three of the anti-absolutist arguments in the previous chapter. The argument from contradiction is easily handled, as we've seen. For Ross, conflict among moral rules does not entail contradiction, since the moral rules that he favors are not absolute. Ross's view can also make quick work of the argument from disaster prevention. This argument claims that any moral rule may be broken if that is what it takes to prevent a catastrophe. As a result, no moral rules are absolute. Ross naturally agrees with this. None of his moral rules is absolute. When the stakes are high enough, each of them may acceptably be sacrificed. The argument from irrationality charges that absolutism is inconsistent, since the values at the heart of its rules can sometimes be better served by violating those rules. Ross can argue with this criticism as well. If we must break a promise in order to ensure that many more are kept, Ross can allow that this promise ought to be broken. The charge of irrationality stems from the absolutist claim that certain rules must be obeyed no matter the consequences. Ross rejects this absolutist claim. But Ross also denies the push to consequentialism that lies at the heart of the last two arguments. Both of them try to show that the morality of our actions always depends on their results. Think of those two arguments like this. If obeying a rule leads to a catastrophic outcome or results in greater violations of that rule, then that rule cannot be absolute. These are consequentialist reasons for rejecting absolutism. 
Ross believed, of course, that the moral rules are not absolute, but he did not get there by assuming with consequentialists that our moral duty is always to maximize good results. Though he agreed with utilitarians that results are morally important, he denied that they are all important. Doing justice, for instance, or improving oneself is sometimes more important than doing what is optimistic. Indeed, to make his case against consequentialism, Ross has us imagine a situation in which we are faced with a choice. We can benefit person A or B. We can benefit person A by fulfilling our promise to him, or we can benefit person B just slightly more, though we have made no promise to him. If we benefit B, we break a promise. Further, B has no expectation that we will benefit him. Ross thought it obvious that we ought to keep our promise to A, even though we would do more good by benefiting B. This thought experiment convinced Ross of two things. First, there is a prima facie duty of fidelity. There is always something morally important about keeping our word. And second, consequentialism is mistaken, since this is a case in which one option, benefiting B, produces the most good, but is morally wrong. So, while Ross agrees with the conclusion of the anti-absolutist arguments, he denies that we should be led to consequentialism as a result. A problem for Ross's view. In Ross's view, preventing harm is always morally important. Sometimes it is the most important thing you can do, but not always. Seeing that the guilty get their just desserts is also, and always, very important. If Kant is right, it always takes priority over preventing harm. If utilitarians are right, it never takes priority. If Ross is right, it sometimes does, and sometimes doesn't. This leads us naturally to what may be the hardest problem for Ross's view. Ross denies that there are any absolute moral rules, so each moral rule may sometimes be broken. Broken. But when? The easiest way to answer that question would be to create a permanent ranking of the rules by placing them in order from least to most morally important. Whenever a lower ranked rule conflicts with a higher ranked one, the higher rule wins out and determines our moral duty. Ross rejects this strategy. He thinks that there is no fixed ranking of the various prima facie rules, no permanent ordering in terms of importance, and he is not alone in this. Though a ranking system is possible in principle, in practice no one has ever made it work. Sometimes it is morally more important to be grateful than to prevent harm but not always. Sometimes it is more important to be honest with people than to spare them the hurt feelings that honesty may cause, and sometimes not. You get the picture. The problem is that if we can't provide a fixed ranking of moral principles, then it isn't clear how we are to decide what to do when they conflict. That is because none of the prima facie duties has any kind of built-in moral weight. They are always important, but just how important? That depends on the specifics of the situation. Yet there are no guidelines that we can use from case to case to help us to know when a prima facie duty takes precedence over a competing duty. If a duty is sometimes, but not always, more important than another, then how do we know which one to obey when we cannot obey them both? This is an extremely hard question, but before we can answer it, it seems we must answer an even harder one. How can we know which prima facie duties are real and which are mere pretenders? For instance, is there really a prima facie moral duty of self-improvement? Ross thought so, but many people think that letting oneself go isn't a moral failing at all. How do we settle the matter? It seems we must first know the true list of prima facie duties before we can get to the more specific question of how to strike an appropriate balance when prima facie duties conflict. Knowing the fundamental moral rules. Here is one of the hardest problems in ethics. How can we know what the fundamental moral rules are? The standard way of justifying a rule is not open to us here. We cannot cite a more general rule to back up the one in question. If the rule is really fundamental, then there are no deeper rules from which it derives its force. When we call such a rule into question, how can its correctness be defended? Ross had an answer. He claimed that his prima facie duties were self-evident. A claim is self-evident just in case it is true, and adequately understanding it is enough to make you justified in believing it. Self-evident truths are those that you are justified in believing on the basis of careful reflection alone. If you think hard about such claims and come to believe them as a result, then you will have knowledge. I think that there are some self-evident claims. Here are a few. All bachelors are unmarried. If Alice is taller than Bob and Bob is taller than Charlie, then Alice is taller than Charlie. Anything that happened a decade ago occurred prior to today's events. Uncles have or had siblings. The sum of any two odd numbers is even. Some of these claims are just obvious. Others may take a bit of time to sort out. Self-evident claims need not be obvious. What is crucial is that careful reflection is all it takes to know them. Suppose that some moral rules are self-evident. Then we have a way of calling a halt to an otherwise infinite chain of moral questioning. Our stopping points will be self-evident claims that require no further justification. If Ross is right, then all seven of his principles are self-evident. We can know them just by thinking about what they really stand for. If we can rid ourselves of distorting influences, such things as bias, hasty judgments, and over-emotional involvement, we 
will be convinced that there is always something right about keeping promises, preventing harm, doing justice, showing gratitude, and so on. Self-evidence and the testing of moral theories. Ross thinks that his theory of prima facie duties and his confidence in their self-evidence are in deep harmony with common sense. And as he sees it, this is a great benefit of his theory. We should not overturn the biddings of common sense just because it conflicts with a pet theory. Ross used the example of beauty to establish this point. Many of us feel sure that the Mona Lisa is a beautiful work. We should not abandon our belief in its beauty just because some theory of art declares that only impressionist paintings or medieval altar pieces are really beautiful. We should give up the theory before tossing aside our deepest, most secure beliefs. What is true of our artistic judgments is also true of our moral ones. We can see how this plays out by considering Ross's rejection of consequentialism. Ross was quite clear-eyed about how tempting consequentialism can be, but he insisted that it was fatally flawed because it failed to appreciate the variety of fundamental moral concerns. Consequentialism imposes order, system, and a unifying principle onto our moral thinking, but he argued that we must resist such charms because they conflict with our deepest beliefs about what is truly morally important. Our confidence in the independent value of promise-keeping, or justice, or repairing our wrongs, should not be held hostage to a theory's demands. If Ross is right, we use our deepest common-sense beliefs, some of which will be self-evident as the way to test moral theories. Our self-evident beliefs have a kind of priority in moral thinking. It isn't as if each moral belief we have is beyond scrutiny. Far from it. Some of our moral views, perhaps even our most cherished ones, may have to go once we see that they conflict with beliefs that are even better justified. Still, the data of ethical thought, as Ross puts it, are those moral beliefs that have survived very careful reflection. Self-evident principles are where our moral thinking must begin. They are what moral theories must account for. These basic beliefs are to be given up only if we can show that they can't all be true. To the extent that a moral theory cannot make room for such beliefs, it is the theory that must go. This was Ross's diagnosis of both consequentialism and Kantianism, for instance. They both understood morality too narrowly, as limited to a single fundamental moral rule. He thought that careful reflection would show us that there are at least seven such rules, none of them absolute. Ross realized that his view offered little comfort to those who did not agree with his seven principles, but he was unapologetic. To someone who thought about justice, for instance, and failed to see its moral importance, Ross could do only one thing. He would invite that person to think more carefully about what justice really is. This can be done in many ways. We can offer the person examples to consider, draw analogies to cases that reveal the importance of justice, distinguish justice from other possibly related notions, ensure that particular beliefs opposing the importance of justice are not based on error, but suppose that the person remains unconvinced even after all of this further reflection. According to Ross, moral discussion now comes to an end, and the only verdict to render is that this person is mistaken. Nothing you can say will show him that he is wrong. This may strike you as closed-minded, but two things can be said in Ross's defense. First, what are the alternatives? Why must it always be possible to offer something more in support of one's beliefs? If the process of offering justification for one's beliefs, whether ethical or non-ethical, ever does stop somewhere, then once we have reached that stopping point, all that could possibly be done is to invite the doubters to reconsider. Second, we should consider the possibility, in non-moral contexts, of finding ourselves without any support for a claim that we rightly continue to believe. For instance, there may be nothing you can say that will convince a member of the Flat Earth Society of his mistake, no way to convince someone who believes in vampires that he is wrong, no clear path to showing a stubborn person that creating a square circle is impossible. You may be justified in your beliefs even if you can't always convince those who disagree with you. That holds for moral as well as non-moral beliefs. Knowing the right thing to do. Even if our prima facie duties are self-evident, we are still faced with the problem of knowing what to do when they conflict. And Ross has very little to say here, except that we can never be certain that the balance we strike is the correct one. Ross acknowledged that our actual all-things-considered moral duty on any given occasion is not something that is self-evident. We may feel very strongly about certain cases, indeed most moral situations are easy and straightforward, ones we can never give a second thought to. Still, there is no definite method for guiding us from an understanding of the prima facie duties to a correct moral verdict in any given case. We must start our moral thinking about specific situations by understanding the kinds of things that can be morally important. This is a matter of clearly grasping the prima facie duties. These tell us what to look out for. Has a promise been made? A wrong been done? Is there an opportunity for self-improvement here? And so on. But once you answer such questions, you're on your own. You must bring your own experience and insight to bear on the details of a given case. The bad news is that there is no fixed or mechanical procedure that tells us how to do this. This can be very dissatisfying. There are several aims of moral theory and one of them, surely, is to offer advice on deciding how to live. Ross denies that there is any general rule to follow in order to provide answers here. 
What a letdown. But again, there are a few things we might say in order to make this a bit easier to swallow. First, the idea of a comprehensive moral decision procedure, one that can be consulted to provide definite answers to all moral questions, may not be so plausible. When faced with puzzling ethical questions, we may want a concrete set of guidelines to help us along, but do we really believe that there is such a thing? Each of the familiar options, e.g. the principle of utility, the golden rule, the what-if-everyone-did-that test, has its problems. Perhaps the best explanation of this is that we are looking for something that does not exist. Second, Ross's theory is not the only ethical view that abandons the idea of a moral decision procedure. The theories that we next consider, both virtue ethics and feminist ethics, also deny that there is any surefire method for discovering moral truth. And as we've seen, even consequentialism can fail to supply a procedure for determining our moral duty. If more than one thing is intrinsically valuable, then it will be unclear what to do when we can maximize one value without maximizing the other. Finally, the absence of a decision procedure for arriving at conclusions is actually the default situation across all areas of thinking, except mathematics and its associated disciplines. For instance, scientists faced with a conflict between their data and some favored theory have no uniform method for determining whether to modify the theory or rethink their data. Further, even when the data are uncontroversial, selecting the best theory to account for it is anything but a rote mechanical undertaking. Scientists must rely on good sense, too, since choosing which theory to believe is a matter of balancing the virtues of the competing theories. There is no precise rule to tell a scientist how to do this. There are many theoretical virtues. Parsimony, employing fewer assumptions than competing theories. Conservatism, preserving as much as possible of what we already believe. Generality, explaining the broadest range of things. Testability, being open to experimental challenge and confirmation. And others. Suppose that one theory is more parsimonious and also more conservative, but another theory is more general and more testable. Or suppose that one theory is far more conservative than any competitor, but is also somewhat less general and a fair bit less parsimonious. Science does not offer us a definite procedure for identifying the better theory. Sometimes it is just obvious that one theory is better or worse than another. But in close cases, scientists have no alternative but to use their judgment. And that is precisely our situation when it comes to morality. There are many easy cases where the moral verdict is just obvious. These rarely get our attention since they don't call for any hard thinking. It's the difficult cases where different opinions each respect some prima facie duties but violate others that require judgment. We can never be sure that we've exercised good judgment. We may be unable to convince ourselves, much less our opponents, that we have landed on the right answer to a hard ethical question. The lack of guidance we get from Ross's view of ethics can leave us feeling insecure and unsettled. That is regrettable, but it may also be inescapable. Ethical Particularism The ethic of prima facie duties offers a serious challenge to both absolutism and to monism, yet there is a view known as ethical particularism that is an even more extreme challenge. Particularists reject absolutism, they reject monism, they also deny the existence of any prima facie duties. Recall that a central feature of such duties is that they represent moral reasons that are always important. Every time you do wrong, for instance, there is excellent reason to repair the damage. There is, without exception, something to be said for keeping the promises you've made. True prima facie duties point to features that are always morally important. Particularists deny that anything meets this description. As they see it, something's moral importance depends entirely on context. If they are right, then sometimes there is nothing good at all about righting a wrong, or benefiting someone else, or preventing harm to others. The moral value of such things depends entirely on the details of the case. We have to consider all of the features in a given situation before we can know the moral contribution that any one of them makes. Prima facie moral rules claim that certain features, e.g. promise-keeping, self-improvement, preventing harm, are always morally important. Absolute moral rules state that certain features are not always morally important, but also morally decisive. These features settle the matter of our moral duty once and for all. Particularism, then, is the view that there are no prima facie or absolute moral rules. That sounds pretty drastic. Certainly, particularism occupies one end of the spectrum of moral theories with monistic, absolutist theories such as ethical egoism or act utilitarianism at the other. If particularists are right, then morality is entirely particular to specific situations. There are no moral rules at all to help us navigate our way in the world. Consider an example of particularist thinking. It is often important to keep our promises, but not always. And so Ross was mistaken to think that promise-keeping is a prima facie duty. A promise made by a hostage to her kidnapper carries no weight, nor is there anything good about returning a promised weapon to its now obviously homicidal owner. If particularists are right, there is sometimes no reason at all to keep a promise. Particularists think that every prima facie rule is subject to this sort of criticism. For each of Ross's prima facie duties, and for any others, particularists will try to offer counterexamples to the rule. A prima facie rule says that X, self-improvement, doing justice, etc., is always morally important. 
Particularist will try to come up with cases in which X has no moral value at all. If they are right, nothing possesses any fixed moral importance. Whether something has moral value always depends on the other features in a situation. Particularists often use non-moral examples to soften us up to their core idea. The intense coloring of a Turner painting is an essential part of what makes it so beautiful, but such colors would ruin a piece by Whistler. The paint drips that make Jackson Pollock's work so interesting would completely spoil a Monet. The lesson here is that whether something makes a difference to the beauty of an object depends entirely on context. There are no rules of beauty because there are no features that always enhance or spoil the beauty of an object. That a person told me something is sometimes a reason to believe it, and sometimes not, if we are playing a bluffing game, for instance. That an act is against the law is usually a reason not to do it, but not always. Think of cases of justified civil disobedience. That I want something is often a reason for me to do it, and sometimes it isn't. Consider an addict's desires. Here we have cases in which things sometimes but not always count as a reason. When this is so, the features in question have no place in either a prima facie or an absolute rule. Particularists rely on such examples to show us that theirs is the ordinary view when it comes to non-moral matters, and yet when applied to morality it is met with great resistance. There are three primary sources of opposition. Three problems for ethical particularism. Its lack of unity. This criticism and the next should be familiar from our discussion of prima facie duties. Monists attacked Ross's theory because, in the words of one critic, it offered us nothing more than an unconnected heap of duties. Monists felt uncomfortable with the idea of several fundamental moral rules rather than just one. Indeed, as we have seen, philosophers are strongly tempted to look for a certain sort of moral theory, a body of unified, systematically interconnected claims that stem from a single fundamental truth. Ross's theory was a disappointment in this respect, particular completely dashes such hopes. On the particularist picture, the moral realm is hugely complex and there are no moral rules at all to help guide us on our way. But this cannot be a decisive criticism of particularism. We might hope for simplicity and elegance, but the moral realm may be much messier than we had thought. We can't assume from the outset that monism is true, and then criticize particularism for failing to embrace a single supreme moral rule. Whether the moral realm is neatly ordered, as monists believe, whether it is somewhat structured, as Ross argued, or whether it is highly disordered, as particularists insist, is a matter that can be settled only after a great deal of further moral debate. Accounting for Moral Knowledge the second criticism leveled against particularists is that their view provides us with no guidance for gaining moral knowledge. Ross's theory, as we know, came in for criticism on this front since he failed to offer general advice about how to balance prima facie duties when they conflict. But particularism takes this worry to a new level, since Ross, at least, was able to instruct us on what to look out for in all of the cases we might face. The prima facie rules serve as useful signposts to indicate the features that are relevant in discovering our moral duty. By contrast, particularists tell us that anything that has once been a force for good may, at other times, be either morally neutral or positively bad. There is no way to know in advance how things are going to play out, nor is there any method to follow that can clue you into the correct moral verdict in a given situation. We don't have any rules to tell us what is morally important, and we lack rules to tell us how to figure out our moral duty in specific cases. If the moral importance of everything depends on context, then there is no general road map to follow for those who want to know their moral duty. Indeed, particularists can offer almost no such advice at all other than some very broad tips. Take careful note of details, don't confuse self-interest with morality, get the facts straight, etc. Basically, they must insist that our moral knowledge comes only through a comprehensive appreciation of all of the relevant features of a situation. Just as we can take in the beauty of a canvas only by noticing how each distinct feature plays off the others, so too we can detect the morality of an action only by taking careful note of all of its important features and their interplay with one another. Another. The features that are relevant in any given situation cannot be known in advance since no features possess permanent moral importance. So particularism fails to supply a general blueprint for gaining moral wisdom, yet this is a serious failing only if there is such a blueprint. There may be, but that remains to be seen. Some things possess permanent moral importance. We can best appreciate the deepest criticism of particularism by considering the central argument in its favor. Call this the particularist argument. 1. If nothing possesses permanent moral importance, then there are no prima facie or absolute moral rules. 2. Nothing possesses permanent moral importance. 3. Therefore, there are no prima facie or absolute moral rules. 4. If there are no prima facie or absolute moral rules, then particularism is true. 
5, therefore particularism is true. This argument has only three premises. Premise 1 is completely uncontroversial. Premise 4 is also secure, so long as there are any moral truths at all. We'll consider the possibility that there aren't any and that morality is all make-believe in chapter 20. So if you have doubts about particularism, then you need to focus on that second premise. And that is just what critics will do. They will insist that the central claim of particularism, given in premise 2, that there are no features that are always morally important, is mistaken. If that premise is false, then there are at least some prima facie moral rules. Whether there are any absolute rules depends, of course, on whether there are any features, e.g. maximizing happiness, being commanded by God, that are morally decisive in every possible context. To undermine particularism, we would have to provide examples of features that are always morally important. Perhaps Ross managed to do this. Consider doing justice, for example. Relying on the regret test mentioned earlier, see page 240. It seems that there is always some reason for regret when we commit injustice, even if injustice really is the way to go in a given case. But I don't want to rest anything on my view of this matter. That's because we can leave justice aside and still show that particularism is in trouble. There seem to be a number of prima facie duties even if they are not the ones that Ross himself favored. For instance, I think that there is always an excellent reason against humiliating people, hurting others strictly for the pleasure it gives you, intentionally killing an innocent person who wants to live, betraying a friend's trust, knowingly violating an oath because of greed and committing rape. Maybe none of these represents an absolute moral rule. Perhaps, in unusual circumstances, it can be morally acceptable to commit each of these acts. But there would always be something to regret in doing so, and that is good evidence that there is a prima facie duty not to do so. Such things. This list is certainly not complete, but if my list, or a better one that you can construct, is plausible, then particularism is mistaken. Morality would have more order and structure than particularists allow. They claim that we can never know in advance, independently of context, whether something is morally important. If there are any prima facie moral rules, that claim is false. Conclusion. The ethic of prima facie duties has a lot of things going for it. It is pluralistic and so rejects the idea that the whole of morality can ultimately be explained by a single moral rule. It rejects absolutism and so explains why it is sometimes permitted to break legitimate moral rules. It easily handles moral conflict without falling into contradictions. It offers an interesting role for regret in thinking about what is morally important. And it nicely handles some of the most difficult arguments designed to undermine moral absolutism. Yet, like all of the moral theories we have discussed, Ross's view is not without its problems. Perhaps the hardest of these concerns is the question of how we can know what to do in particular situations. Since there is no permanent ranking of the prima facie rules, and no precise method for knowing how to strike a balance when the prima facie rules conflict, this leaves us with very little guidance for discovering what morality actually requires of us. Ross also has the worry of explaining how we might gain moral knowledge of his prima facie rules. I think that the question of how we can know the fundamental rules of morality is very, very hard, and Ross can take some comfort in the knowledge that every moral thinker shares this problem. I sketched two general strategies, plus one skeptical response, that might be of some help here, but this of course offers only the very beginning of the needed discussion. As we have seen, those who resist both absolutism and monism need not go in for prima facie duties. They may embrace ethical particularism, which denies that there are any moral rules at all. On this view, nothing is always morally important, much less always morally decisive. Particularism is a bold thesis, but but despite its boldness, it does seem that there are some things that are permanently morally important, and if that is so, then there are some prima facie rules after all. The particularist can still level a challenge to those who think that morality is rule-based. Imagine that after a great deal of thought we were able to identify a dozen prima facie rules. It might still be the case that most of the morally important features we encounter in our lives were not mentioned in any of those rules, because these features are only sometimes and not always morally important. For instance, suppose that my earlier remarks about promise-keeping were on target and that there really are cases in which nothing at all favors our keeping a promise. Still, the fact that we promise to do something usually is morally important, even though, on the present assumption, there is no absolute or prima facie moral rule that tells us so. Likewise, for telling the truth, there is ordinarily a strong reason to be truthful, even if there are some cases when there is no moral value at all in telling the truth. If morality is really like this, where many features that are morally important are not always so, then we have a kind of hybrid view, a mix of Ross's theory and particularism. Some types of action possess permanent moral importance, as Ross said, others do not. If that were so, then we would be faced with a moral world that was far less simple and unified than the one presented by monists and absolutists. Is that our world? That is for you to decide.